No one talks enough about good old Garland the Gallant. That's just what happens when you're the middle child in a noble family. His older brother, Willis Tyrell, is the heir to Highgarden. Marjorie's now a queen, and baby brother Loris has made himself to be the realm's favorite knight. This whole family has everyone's attention. The whole family, except Garland. Despite him being more than qualified to be a fan favorite, he just isn't given enough time to shine, though he has one of the biggest feats during the War of the Five Kings. Garland just chooses to avoid all the attention, which is easier being part of such a large family, and everyone around him having such loud personalities. What makes Garland the Gallant so great is everything. Everything about this minor character is cool. His epithet is the Gallant. That should say it all, and he lives up to it. In the third book, during Sansa and Tyrion's wedding celebrations, we learn the backstory to that name. Lady Sansa, Sir Garon Tyrell stood beside the dais. Would you honor me if your lord consents? The imp's mismatched eyes narrowed. My lady can dance with whomever she pleases. Perhaps she ought to have remained beside her husband, but she wanted to dance so badly, and Sir Garlin was brother to Marjorie, to Willis, to her knight of flowers. I see why they name you Garlin the Gallant, sir, she said. As she took his hand, my lady is gracious to say so. My brother Willis gave me that name as it happens, to protect me. To protect you? She gave him a puzzled look. Sir Garland laughed. I was a plump little boy, I fear. And we do have an uncle called Garth the Gross. So Willis struck first, though not before threatening me with Garland the Greensick, Garland the Galling, and Garland the Gargoyle. The little backstory says a lot more about nice big brother Willis than it does about Garland, but he lived up to that name, even shed that chunky figure. Gallant has to do with bravery in battle and chivalry with women. His concern for Sansa, when it was cool to view her as a traitor spawn, covers a chivalrous part. We get a taste of the courageous warrior part during the Battle of the Blackwater. If you haven't picked up by now, Garland was written out of Game of Thrones. That's how much he avoided the spotlight. But no, the writers of the show regularly combine characters to simplify the story for viewers. So in Game of Thrones, Loras absorbed both his older brother's plots, Willis and Garland. That's why we never get to see how skilled Garland was towards the end of the second season. With Littlefinger's planning, Garland wore the deceased Renly Baratheon's iconic green armor, decorated with an antlered helm. The idea was to confuse and terrify Stannis' army, who believed Renly to no longer be a threat. A lot of Renly's former followers from the Stormlands jumped over to Stannis' side after his assassination, but most of the Reach remained neutral, until Littlefinger brokered an alliance between the Lannisters and Tyrells. Garland, being a very skilled fighter, is given command over the vanguard. The opposition believed the ghost of Renly Baratheon was fighting against them, which was a major factor in the victory over Stannis. Right when King's Landing seemed like it was going to fall, the Reach came to save the day. In all the dark confusion, Sansa is informed while hiding away that Lord Tywin himself had their right wing on the north side of the river, with Randall Tarly commanding the center and Mace Tyrell the left, but the vanguard won the fight. They plunged through Stannis like a lance through a pumpkin, every man of them howling like some demon in steel. And do you know who led the vanguard? Do you? Do you? Do you? Rob, it was too much to be hoped. It was Renly, Lord Renly in his green armor, with the fires shimmering off his golden antlers. Lord Renly with this tall spear in his hand. They say he killed Sir Guybert Morgan, himself in single combat, and a dozen other great knights as well. It was Renly, it was Renly, it was Renly. Oh, the banners, darling Sansa. Oh, to be a knight. Garland was the hero of the battle, but no one would know it was him. Some would suspect it was Loris, since he was the close friend, former squire, and suspected lover. But the armor was too big for Loris. Renly had the strong man Baratheon DNA running through him, a similar build to Garland. So when the flashy green armor didn't fit Loris, Garland stepped in in his place, performed better than his younger brother ever could. Loras tells Sansa that Garland trains while fighting three against one, and sometimes four against one, because he believes in a battle it's rarely a single combat situation. Garland likes to be prepared. Loras then goes on to say Garland is a better swordsman than him. Huge praise from someone as full of himself as Loras. But he had to add in, while Garland's a better sword, he's the better lance. That's because he spends all his time being a tourney fighter, where a crowd cheers your name and there's a lot less danger. Seems like Garland took up all the chivalry for the both of them. With all his overconfidence, Loras still decides to sort of cheat his way to the final tilts during the hands turn in the first book. He decides to use a mare in heat to face off with the master of Gregor Clegane and his stallion. So not confident enough with the lands to beat the mountain. 
though just a year prior, right before the story begins, Loris did happen to an attorney celebrating Joffrey's birthday, even beating Jamie Lannister, who was regarded as one of the most skilled fighters when he was whole. But no champion titles for Garland, even with all Mace's pressure to bring glory to the Tyrell name. Garland doesn't even bother entering the lists. You would think their father would learn his lesson after the damage he caused Willis when he was younger. Some more years back, Mace wanted his heir Willis to enter a tourney when he was considered too young for that level of competition. He wasn't even knighted yet, just a squire. Well, Willis would end up facing Oberyn Martell in the tilts, one of the world's most dangerous men, in his first ever tourney. When Oberyn inevitably knocked Willis out of his horse, the horse came down with him, crushing his leg permanently, leaving him walking around with leg support. While people mocked him as a cripple, he would never fight again. But it didn't crush his spirits. He found other hobbies to occupy his time before his time comes to rule in Highgarden. And though House Tyrell and Martell have always had a tense relationship due to generations of territory wars, Oberyn and Willis were cool after. I'd go as far as to say friends. So Garland clearly takes after his older brother Willis, and Loras following the foolish footsteps of their father. Garland for sure took out Sir Gyard Morgan in single combat, who only recently was part of Renly's Rainbow Guard. Essentially his king's guard, so a real threat. There'd be too many claiming that achievement for it not to be true, but the whole slaying a dozen other great knights is questionable. Garland's good, but I think it was just added to create a bigger legend for Renly's ghost. A nice little embellishment. It wouldn't surprise me if Garland did kill a few more men aside from Gyard. After Garland and the Tyrell army won the battle for the Lannisters against Stannis during the Battle of the Blackwater, Joffrey, king at the time, was granting the Tyrells anything they wanted after saving his little life. Sir Garland Tyrell, five years senior to Soloris, was a taller bearded version of his more famous younger brother. He was thicker about the chest and broader in the shoulders, and though his face was comely enough, he lacked Sir Loris' startling beauty. Your grace, Garland said when the king approached him, I have a maiden sister, Marjorie, the delight of our house. She was wed to Renly Baratheon, as you know. But Lord Renly went to war before the marriage could be consummated, so she remains innocent. Marjorie has heard tales of your wisdom, courage, and chivalry, and has come to love you from afar. I beseech you to send for her, to take her hand in marriage, and to wed your house to mine for all time. The ambitious Lord Mace Tyrell wanted more power, because being the Warden of the South wasn't enough for him. He asked for a seat on the small council. Loris asked for a spot on the Kingsguard. The man who actually had an impact in the battle only asked for his younger sister to be raised in status. He stayed humble, but obviously something Mace put him up to with the whole Marjorie's betrothal. In the books, Oleta Tyrell hoped to set up a marriage between Willis and Sansa to align the North with the Reach, but the Lannisters got in the way of that. That plotline was given to Loras instead in Game of Thrones. Garland is already married to Lynette Fossaway, a lady from a prominent house in the Reach. Not sure when that wedding happened and this couple is really moving up in the world. Since some houses from the Reach aligned with Stannis, mainly House Florent because of Stannis' wife being Selyse Florent, it was time to strip them from their lands and titles. Highgarden reaped the richest harvest. Tyrion eyed Mace Tyrell's broad belly and thought, he has a prodigious appetite, this one. Tyrell demanded the lands and castles of Lord Alistair Florent, his own bannerman who'd had the singular ill judgment to back, first Renly and then Stannis. Lord Tywin was pleased to oblige. Brightwater Keep and all its lands and incomes were granted to Lord Tyrell's second son, Sir Garland, transforming him into a great lord in the blink of an eye. Garland has just formed his own branch family, House Tyrell of Brightwater Keep. A very big deal with how prominent House Florent is and always has been for thousands of years. But Brightwater isn't vacant. Garland's still gonna have to fight for it if he wants it. While still in King's Landing, there was some formal events to attend before he could get to that, like Sansa's wedding to Tyrion and his own sister wedding to Joffrey. These two separate chapters is where we get a ton of characterization for Garland, showing him to be a top tier character. He does more than just comfort Sansa by sharing his backstory. He's like Tyrion's best buddy and gives Sansa hope when she had none. Garland says, My lady wife is most concerned for you, he said quietly, when at such time. Lady Lynette is too sweet, tell her I'm well. A bride at her wedding should be more than well, his voice was not unkind. You seemed close to tears. Tears of joy, sir. Your eyes give the lie to your tongue. Sir Garland turned her, drew her close to the side. My lady, I have seen how you look at my brother. Loris is valiant and handsome, and we all love him dearly. But your imp will make a better husband. 
He is a bigger man than he seems, I think. Not even Tywin and Cersei could look past Tyrion's physical appearance and see the good in him, but Garland spotted it immediately without even having to spend much time around him. Plus, he surely knew about Loras' sexuality. Garland the Gallant would continue to be Sansa and Tyrion's only real allies in the third book, when things were going from bad to worse for them. When Joffrey destroys the rare gift Tyrion got him for his wedding, it's Garland to speak up respectfully to state how childish that was. When the singers at the wedding falsely spread tales of Joffrey's bravery during the battle, Garland cheers up Tyrion after he says, If I am ever hand again, the first thing I'll do is hang all the singers, said Tyrion too loudly. Lady Lynette laughed lightly beside him, and Sir Garland leaned over to say, A valiant deed unsung is no less valiant. Lady Lynette giggled, Perhaps you should be a singer, my lord. You rhyme as well as this galleon. No, my lady, Sir Garland said. My lord of Lannister was made to do great deeds, not to sing of them. But for his chain and his wildfire, the foe would have been across the river. And if Tyrion's wildlings had not slain most of Lord Stannis' scouts, we would never have been able to take him unawares. His words made Tyrion feel absurdly grateful, and helped to mollify him as Galleon sang endless verses about the valor of the boy king and his mother, the Golden Queen. When Joffrey dumps his wine onto Tyrion, Garland steps in to say that was ill done to the king's face. And finally, when everyone believes drunk Joffrey is choking to death on his wedding pie, Garland is the first to run and try to save him, even after seeing Joffrey for what he is and the man his sister would have to deal with. He still tried to save him. Little did he know it was his own grandmother who poisoned him. Garland has a lot of obstacles ahead of his story arc. We don't get much more of him after Joffrey's death and Marjorie is now facing a Cersei's adultery charges, and his castle Brightwater is still being held by a lingering Florence. Marjorie selects Garland out of every knight in the Seven Kingdoms to defend her honor in a trial by combat if it comes to that. But she's informed only a member of the Kingsguard can fight for a queen, and Loras is either mortally or seriously injured, last we heard from him. Her remaining choices are rough, and now the Ironborn are raiding the Reach, which requires his attention. Upcoming Garland the Gallant POV chapter? Maybe. Definitely a deserving character. Thanks for watching, guys.